Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Alrighty, so there's a notes document called February 21 Notes. We may uh, fill it in. This one's pretty basic, so it's not going to take us too long to, to uh, slip through it. So one thing to note, and we were already doing this, to be honest, but if you wind up with a complicated expression, an expression being a series of variable names and symbols, you know, variable names and, uh, yeah, you know, operators, multiply, addition, subtract, stuff like that. Here's an example of a fairly complex. It's not that complex. You can look at it and kind of figure out what it's doing pretty quickly, at least because it's got good variable names. If it was x times y plus a times b is equal to c, then you go, I don't have a clue what it's doing. But at least it's got good variable names. However, it's still kind of hard to get your your mind wrapped around it at first glance. So if you break it up in this, a series of steps, multiple statements to compute the commission. Base property price is a square feet times the price per foot. The total sale price is a base property price plus the premium. I've seen too many social media posts that involve the word lol, because that looked like lol premium to me. Lot premium. Anyways. That's how you calculate the total sale price. And then the salesperson commission is equal to that. This is a lot easier to read, in my opinion. Yeah, it took more to type. But it's a lot easier to read. And if I made a mistake, it's probably easier to figure out where I made a mistake because I could print out all three variables and I would know, you know, which one broke. So, really good idea. Now, on our conversion programs, for the most part, we just did this. Uh, maybe one person you know, combine the conversion all in all into a single line. And that's fine too, you know, but uh, if you can break it up, it helps just as a general line of thinking. If something is more complex, complex enough that you can't spot it in your mind what it's doing immediately, or more to the point, if somebody else looking at it couldn't figure out immediately what it's doing, follow the logic, then it's a good idea. This is an example of good variable names as well. Instead of TSP, total sale price. Instead of COM for commission, salesperson commission. Always a good idea to use good variable names. Even if in here I tend to use A, B, and C just because they're easier to type. Do what I say, not what I do. You know, There's a difference between choosing things that are easy to type in this class so that we don't spend as much time on debugging and writing good programs. So, writing good prompts. Please enter a number. That's not very helpful. The following prompt is more helpful. Please enter a five-digit catalog order number. Here's an even more helpful note, prompt. The five-digit catalog order appears on the right of the item's picture in the catalog. Please enter it now. That's almost too much information. But, uh, you know, just tell the user exactly what they need. And nowadays everything's graphical. You know, you enter a search term, you get pictures of, of everything you're going to order and you just click on it. But still, the idea carries. Echoing the input for better prompting. For example, output, please enter the customer's name. You input their name. And then what we've been doing was probably just say, please enter the balance due. But we could say, please enter the balance due for so-and-so. Why would that be important? Well, if you just typed in the user's name, you probably know the user's name and don't need to show it again. But if you're doing some kind of lookup, like a database lookup, you know, please enter customer ID, one, two, three, four, five. Please, you know, enter, you know, new balance. Well, it's really good idea to present the user with information about the record that they just looked up. Show them the name and uh, other information about it so that, uh, you know, you can go, oh, well, you know, I thought customer 12345 was Bob, but instead it's Joe. I don't really want to change that, so I'm going to back out of it. So it's an awfully good idea to echo information to try to make the prompts as useful as possible and to allow some kind of a 
not second guessing, but error checking on the part of the user. Oh, that's not really who I wanted to look for. And in case of programs as simple as we're writing, that's not as important. But just tuck that away in your head. If you ever do a lookup or a calculation or something like that, and then you're going to display some output after that, it's not a bad idea to give them more information. Like on our milk problem. Display both the gallons of milk and the price, rather than just the price, you know. We probably ought to be also displaying, you know, what we decided the cost of milk was, so that that output would really make sense to the user and they would know why it wasn't what they were expecting. So the way that they've written their program here, please enter customer's name, Joe Bob, please enter the balance due for Joe Bob. A little bit more useful. If it had to do a lookup on Joe Bob, then, um, you know, if it had to hit a database for Joe Bob, then you could display some information here, identifying information, you know, to make sure that the record is correct. Joe Bob and in parentheses address, or Joe Bob and show their picture, or whatever you're supposed to do. Whatever would make it helpful. Okay, here's an example of a horrible flowchart. It's hard to write code like this anymore. Back in the earlier days of programming, where there were such things as go-to statements, it wasn't hard to write a program like this. And this flowchart might match that syntax. Nowadays, with structured programming languages that support if statements and whiles and things like that, it'd be real hard to turn this flowchart into a program. But what's wrong with it? Well, we have lines going up. We have, you know, it's just bad. This is an example of spaghetti code. Spaghetti code is when you find it very difficult to trace the flow of program, a lot of uh, the flow control, the sequence in which step um, operations are performed when you look at the code or when you look at the flow chart. Now if we look at this, maybe it makes sense. Catch the dog. Does the dog run away? Yes. Catch the dog. No? Okay. Turn on the water. Does the dog run away? Yes. Turn off the water. Catch the dog. Okay. Anyways. This, this is really horrible, and it could be structured so much better. It could be structured in such a way that it actually made sense. Now, handing this to a user, to a human to follow, they might be able to make some sense out of it. But if you were going to enter it in, as a sequence of steps that you wanted, you know, absolutely to be ironclad or for a program to be able to follow, although a program washing your dog, I don't know about that, but then you'd want to do it more structured. Now, we're not going to actually sit here and turn this into a workable flowchart, at least at this point. We could. It would involve some if statements in. Probably a, a function where you would make sure you were still holding on to the dog so that if the dog ran away, you wouldn't have to keep, you know, it'd be that function, catch the dog. All righty. So we've already broached this topic, but a structure is a basic unit of programming logic. There are basically three fundamental structures. This is more than just input, output, or calculation, or whatever. This is even broader. Sequence. You have sequential instructions, you have selections, and then you have loops. With these three structures alone, you can diagram any task, from doubling a number to performing brain surgery. And so, in our flow charting, a sequence is just a series of steps. Print, enter number, input, number, convert number to float. That's a series of steps. Selection is when you're going to do multiple things based on the input. Now, this language supports an if statement. Some other languages also support something called a switch statement, which is where you have like a super duper if that can do one thing or another thing or another thing or another thing so that you don't have to write a whole bunch of if else's. Same idea, though. So selection, if something is true, do something. Otherwise, do something else or don't do anything at all. And then lastly, the concept of looping. We've seen this already. In flow charting, it's a big mistake to loop if this isn't a while or a for. 
So if it's an if statement, you don't want it to loop back up there. If it's a while, you do want it to loop back up there. And uh, a lot of people, when they're flow charting, if you look in textbooks, don't put the word if or while in there. But logically, conceptually, it's still the same. If you wanted it to loop, you'd have to draw a line back. Although they tend to draw the line above it, which I disagree with. Wouldn't be wrong to do that. All right, we're going to have a homework problem, but we're going to actually do a version of it as an in-class first. So let's define a problem. We're a furniture maker. We ask the user for how many chairs they want. We ask the user for how many desks they want. Now this isn't even flowchart, I'm out of pseudocode. This is just kind of requirements or description of it. We calculate how much this will cost. based on the following information. Chairs cost $50. This is a really cheap furniture maker. A piece. Desks cost $100 a piece. Really, I can't think of any other furniture pieces couches, drawers, chests, tables. Yeah, we ask the user how many tables they want. And for some reason, tables are much more expensive than desks. Tables cost $200 a piece. We wask the user, those wascally wabbits. There we go. All righty. You may be thinking clearly enough about Python code that you could just sit down and write this without doing pseudocode for it. We're not all there. We're going to go ahead and do pseudocode for it. These are broadly, could be all grouped up to an input. This broadly, we could describe as output. And this broadly is enough information in order to do the calculations. So, start. I'm going to add a comment here. Get input. Input chairs. Input desks. Input tables. We need to figure out the cost of the chairs, the cost of the desks, and the cost of the tables. Now we could do this all in one line. We're going to try to break it up just like we showed up here. Cost underscore chairs is equal to chairs times 50. And just to follow our idea of pseudocode, I'm going to tack the word set on in front of that. I'm also going to delete some spaces up here. We also need the cost of the desks and the cost of the tables. Set cost of desks equal to desks times 100. Is it cold in here? Set cost of tables equal to tables times 200. 
Now it'd be neat o keen nifty to store these costs as variables, like up at the top of the program so that they'd be easy to maintain. Cost per chair, cost per desk, cost per table. I'm gonna leave that alone now. Alrighty, it's not enough just to calculate the cost of each individual item. What do we need to do next? Yeah, why don't we just add them all up? Total cost, I'm gonna put an underscore on there. I'm going to tack the word set in front of it. Total cost is equal to cost of chairs plus the cost of desks plus the cost of tables. and then the output. At the minimum, we want to display the total cost. The customer would be happy if they got to see each one of these interim calculations as well. Because if it costs too much, they might go, oh wow, I didn't know those tables costed. costed. I didn't know the tables were priced that high. I might want to lower my number of tables or I might want to you know, negotiate. A lower cost or something. So even though it's not necessarily okay my problem description here didn't even tell you what to output. We should have decided that back in the design phase or in the requirements phase. So I'm gonna scroll up above our pseudocode and say desired output display the number and cost of each item type and then display the total cost. You know, an invoice, a receipt. So print or output chairs, comma, cost of chairs. We're really going to want our message to be better than that, but for pseudocode, that's okay. We're not just going to want to print out two numbers out. We're going to want some text to go along with it. Output desks and the cost of the desks. Bless you. I could have chosen slightly better variable names like quantity chairs or number of chairs, something like that, but I'm not going to go back and change it. And then output the tables and the cost of the tables. And then output total cost. Cap everything off with a stop statement. We're going to turn this into code. I want y'all to do the input section on your own. I'm, I'll type it in, you know, in a few minutes. But you already know how to input chairs and input desks and input tables. In this case, it might be appropriate to use INT rather than float because hopefully they're not asking for 2.54 chairs. But it doesn't matter. You can always use float.
Now to start, I'm just going to grab the pseudocode and paste it in here. I may delete them later, but I'm going to paste a pseudocode, comment everything out, and I'm going to use it as my guide. And I really should dedent all this. You don't have to add all those comments. Just giving you hints as to how I do it. Okay, I'm going to start combining the input statements with the print statements so I don't have to have three lines of code. I could just do two. You don't have to do this. Chairs is equal to input. How many chairs do you wish to buy? Really, that only has two effects, one which affects you and one which affects the user. The effect to use, you just type one less line of code. The effects to the user is that they will type their input on the end of the same line that the printing occurs rather than on the line underneath it. In that case, I'm going to put a space after it so that there's a space between the question mark and what they type. Now I have a choice. I could do the conversion as I ask for it, which is what we've been doing in the past, or I could wait and do all three conversions. I'm going to follow our previous model and convert each piece of data as we type it in. So chairs is equal to float chairs. Same thing for desks. Desks is equal to input, parentheses, quote. How many desks do you need? It is your deskiny. Desks is equal to float desks. And then lastly, the table. Tables is equal to input. How many tables do you need? Now, other languages don't make it as easy to get input. You do have to break them up into a print and an input, usually. But that's okay. We have the option. Why not take advantage of it? And the tables is equal to float tables. Now I'm going to do something and then I'm going to undo it. I'm going to take all three of these conversions to float and put them underneath all of the input. Just to show you what it looks like. That's not a bad way to do it. Bad way to structure it. Looks kind of cleaner in a way. But I'm going to undo it. All righty. We are done with the input at that point. The calculations, gosh, the calculations are easy. It's just a, essentially a copy of that pseudocode and then a paste and remove the pound sign set. But I'll type them in by hand. Cost of chairs is equal to chairs times 50. Cost of desks is equal to desks times 100. Cost of tables is equal to tables times 200. Then total cost is equal to cost of the chairs plus the cost of the desks, plus the cost of the tables. I could be cleaning this stuff up as I go along and delete these big old masses of pseudocode comments, or I could just leave them. I think in my case I'm going to 
clean them up. Alrighty. Now how you're going to display your output is always your own choice unless the requirements specify a very specific format. I'm going to do this. Alright, what is that going to display? It's going to display the number of chairs followed by the words chairs cost dollar sign followed by the price. Now it's going to have too many spaces. I could get rid of that space, get rid of that space. And then it's still going to have too many spaces. It's going to have a space between the dollar sign and the cost. But that's okay. Hopefully they will understand what that means. Now I'm tempted to real real tempted to just copy and paste. Change. But I'll type it in by hand. Print desks, comma, quote, desks costs, dollar sign, quote, cost of the desks. I tend to put too many spaces in these things just to make them really easy to see. You don't have to do the same. And when I say really easy to see, just for y'all to see as you're typing it in. Because it's real easy to put a comma after the quote when it should have been before the quote or vice versa. All right, one more print statement, actually two. The number of tables. quote, tables cost, end quote, comma, cost of the tables. And then one more just to print the total cost. Print total cost. Wait, why don't I print a, dis a description? It's not like total cost of order colon dollar sign comma total underscore cost. conceivable this will even work. I'm going to delete these pseudocode comments. Looks like the entire thing appears on one line of code. I should have put my name and the date and the description of the program on their own lines. Furniture calculator. Now I'm going to do a save as and call it furniture. Then I'm going to try running it. Now usually every time you type something in, there's a syntax error, and that's okay. You'll just fix it. I want to buy 10 chairs, 20 desks, 30 tables. All right, by a miracle, I didn't have any syntax errors, so it ran. Any fixes I could make? Well, I don't need that many spaces there. I could try to line these numbers up, but that's really beyond the, the point of this exercise.
All right, the only improvement that I could see making any sense in this one would be to define a cost per chair, a cost per desk, and a cost per table. That it increases the possibility of syntax errors. But if we wanted to do that, you don't have to do this, but I think it, it makes the program look a little bit better up at the t um, formatted. You'll see what I mean. Above that line that says get input, do this. Cost per desk equals 50. Cost per table equals 100. Cost per chair, I kind of did these in the wrong order. Yeah, let me fix that. Really, it's the cost per chair is 50. The cost per desk is 100. See here, I was making the change, and I was going to be all proud, and then it was going to generate the wrong input, not the wrong output. And then the cost per table is 500. Then just change 50, 100, and 200 to these variable names. So instead of times 50, make it cost per chair. Instead of 100, make it cost per desk. And then lastly, cost per table. Why bother doing this? Well, in a simple, simple program like this, it wasn't necessary. But what we had down there in those calculations are what is known as you know, constants, numeric constants, but more colloquially are known as magic numbers. Where did that 50 come from? Where did that 100 come from? What did that, where did that 500 come from? What do they mean? Well, from context, we can assume that it means cost per chair, cost per desk, and cost per table. But by doing it like this, we spell out very specifically what those values are. More importantly, it makes it easy to change. What if we needed to use the cost per chair in 17 different places in this program, and everywhere we did it as 50? Then, if the customer wanted to raise the price per chair, to 65, you'd have 17 changes you want to make. Whereas if you always used a variable, then you'd only have to change it in one place. That's another reason to define your so-called constants up at the top, rather than hard code them as magic numbers down here in the middle. Another reason is that you could store this data somewhere else in an INI file, in a database, something like that so that the customer would not have to touch the code at all in order to charge you more per table or more per desk. They could just go and edit some file or edit some database. Now we're obviously not at that point. But conceptually, if these things are defined in all in one place rather than hidden down here in the calculations, then generally it's better. Three reasons. Readability of the code. Maybe you think that this is less readable because it's got more writing, but really once you break it down and you look at that line, it makes it incredibly obvious what it's doing. For ease of maintenance, you only have to change those numbers in one place rather than multiple places if they do occur. And just conceptually, if you were going to change the way that these were specified, like from reading in by a database or file, you could do so. All righty, I think that's about enough for our chair program, unless we wanted to make it loop. I don't know if I want to make a loop. I think we could do without making a loop. So our homework is going to be this, a very similar program. That doesn't mean I want you to start working on it while the lecture is going on. Design a program that prompts the user for data about the A to be built. Well, what? I need to revise that. About the house to be built. Let me go and correct that. About a house to be built, including the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, and the number of cars the garage holds. Output the price of the home, which costs $50,000 base price, plus $20,000 for each bedroom, $10,000 for each bathroom, 
and 5,000 for each car. Now our sample did not have a base price. It'd be pretty easy to add though, right? If we wanted to go back here and add a base price to this, like every order cost $50 or something like that, you could just tag that on to the total or something like that. Total underscore cost plus equals or equals total cost plus base price. You would have to define base price somewhere. I didn't mean to throw that in to be tricky. If I've been thinking ahead or remembered that I asked for that in the homework, I would have tacked on that into our example. So going back to this, that's pretty much all I specify. So how you ask for the input and what you display as output is up to you. If you make it display, if you break, if you itemize it so that you display why it costs as much as it does, that much for the bedroom, that much for each, for all the bathrooms, that much for the garage, I think that'd be better. I might give you, you know, a little bit of extra credit if you do it that way, but the requirements are just to output the total. So if you feel like just doing it that way, you can do that. Yeah. The closer you get towards making it look like this with your definitions up at the top and your output giving you a lot of information, the more likely it is I'm going to give you extra credit on it. Honestly, forgotten what forgotten what chapter we were really on, because we've been brushing topics out of all sorts of things like iteration and fruitful functions and stuff like this. Anybody have any recollection of which page we had <laughs> last pulled up? I think. Oh, now we didn't do any of that stuff. And that's pretty cool stuff. Let's go ahead and get this program going. We're going to write a program that draws a flow chart. We may modify it a little bit from what they're doing here. In fact, I'm sure we will. Bar chart program. We know we need a turtle, so import the turtle class. Let's create our turtle. I feel like being lazy and instead of calling it Leo or whatever, I'm just going to call it T. Here we are. Here I go with the single letter variable names, but T is equal to turtle dot capital T turtle. And don't forget the parentheses at the end. All right, we know that we want to draw a lot of bars because a bar chart with only one bar is pretty pathetic. So it would be a good idea to put that in a function so that it can be called multiple times. If we look at the way a bar looks, how does it work? The guy turns left, he draws a certain distance, and then he turns right and he draws a certain distance and then he turns right again and draws a certain distance and then he turns left and draws a certain distance. So it's going to be left, right, right, left. The first left is going to be the height of the bar and then the first right is going to be the width of the bar. The next right is going to be the height of the bar and then there's going to be some spacer. Now that's getting a little bit too complicated so while I've got it in mind I'm going to go make some comments. And while I'm at it let's make a Dropbox for the 
the furniture program. So if you have to leave early, you can you can put that in. Okay, so to draw a bar, turn left, go up the height, or just go the height, or forward the height, whatever we want to say. Turn right, go forward the width, turn right again, go forward the height, you have to go just as far down as you went up and then turn left and go the spacer forward the spacer so we're going to put those in a function define def draw bar If you're an organ player, you have a different idea of what a drawbar is. And we want to pass in the height, in my opinion. But the width and the spacer, in my opinion, ought to be defined as variables beforehand. So above that DEF, let's set the width equal to 50 and the spacer equal to 10. We may want to change those depending on how it looks. Okay, whenever you define a function or any time you start in denning, we have to put a colon. So DEF draw bar parentheses height in parentheses colon. What were our steps? Turn left t dot left, 90 degrees, t dot forward, which I'm just going to abbreviate FD because they let us, the height, t dot right, 90 degrees, t dot forward, the width, Now we got to turn right again and go back down. So T dot right. Another 90 degrees. T dot forward. The height. And then let's turn left to, to draw our spacer. T left 90 degrees. T dot forward, space it. Now that I've done that, I'm going to take these comments out. Now, it's not going to do anything yet. It creates a turtle, but that's it. You know, if I run it now, I'm just going to call this graph one or bar graph, but we'll probably do another bar graph later. So if I run it, here's what it does. Why does it not do anything cool? Well, we never called the draw bar function. Yeah, we defined it. It's like writing a blueprint, but not giving it to the architect to build. It's like writing down an order, but not giving it to the cook. So, let's draw a bar, and I'm just going to make up some numbers. 200, 100, another, another draw bar call, 300. Alrighty. Spliffendiferous, I think there's, whoops, 
had some numbers up at the top and then they filled it we could do all that too at least putting the numbers up there would be cool let's do that so I'm going to add a new line before we draw the width so here I'm adding a new line print the print the height put a label on it so t dot right and if you look at it it starts popping up all this information a line equals left font is equal to Arial 8 normal we could specify a lot of information about what we're printing on the screen we're not going to do that we're just going to print the string version of the height. I haven't explored the write function enough to know exactly why you have to convert it to a string before you print it, but we're just going to go with that. Now the author added some spaces before the height in order to try to get it centered. We could do that. I'm going to go back here and in front of that STR, I'm just going to do a quote followed by maybe three spaces, one, two, three, and then an end quote and a plus sign. What is that again? This is just going to tack on a space. Let me undo that and run it again. You see how the numbers are not centered? Oh, I, gotcha. I don't. I can't think of a way to really center it, but we can fake it by nudging them over. So I'm going to nudge it over with a quote and a couple of spaces. Alrighty, other things. I mean, we could go crazy implementing this program. If we were blue skying it, what would be a cool thing to do? One might be to shift it over so that it filled up the whole screen, not just the right side. What else? There's no wrong answer. Except your answer. It's wrong. No, I'm kidding. Label the bars, maybe? Yeah, label the bars. Make the bars bigger. Make the bars wider. Make the bars width dependent upon how much screen we have or how many of them. Because if you have 20 bars, the width is going to have to be a lot narrower than if you had three bars. We could fill them. Filling them is super easy. Why don't we do that? Add a color up there. Yeah, we could. We let, let's look to see how the author added a color. What they did is that when you specify the color of the turtle, if you give it two colors, one of them is the line color, and then the other one's the fill color. So, I think I'm going to make a black and yellow flow chart. So up here, after I create the turtle, Somewhere around the width and the spacer declarations, I'm going to do t dot set color. And I want the pin to be black, but I want the fill to be yellow. And the author suggested setting the pin size to three, so I'm going to follow along with that. t dot pin size three. Now for that fill to work, we're actually going to have to call begin fill and end fill. The best place to do that would be begin fill before we start drawing anything and end fill before we draw the spacer. So let's do that. This will be the last change we make. 
here. T dot begin underscore fill. That's the very first thing in our drawbar function now. Add that. And then the very last thing is before we draw the spacer. So T dot end underscore fill. Tack that on. And we also added these lines, one to set the color and one to set the pin size. And it blew up. Turtle has no object set color. Let me guess, it's just color. Yes, that's it. Now the picky side of me wants us to make one more change, which is, you know, these bars aren't closed at the bottom. Along with the forward command, there's a back command. We could go back 100 pixels or whatever the width is, and then we could go forward 100 pixels again, and that would fix that. So why not? But we can do that after we've done the fill. So after we turn left, we want to go t dot backwards the width. Fill in the bottom of the rectangle. And then we want to go t dot forward. Why? We're just going to draw that line and then we're going to go back forward again. Don't have to add the comments, but I'm putting them there to make sure that you see which lines we just added. Now I'm feeling like making it lift the pin and put it back out. Well, I think we've done enough. All right, we could use this later on. Like if we let the user type in a series of test scores, we could print out a bar graph based on what they typed. Or if we wanted to count the number of times the number, the letter A appears in a web page as compared to the letter B and the letter C and so on, then we could do that. But let's leave it alone. We'll stop here. Go ahead and upload that one. It's not one where I'm going to be super picky and actually make you, uh, you know, correct it and re-upload it. But I think it's pretty cool, and you might want to have a copy of it saved permanently. So go ahead and put it in the Dropbox. Any questions? Do you want the bar graph and furniture in there, or just the furniture? I'd recommend putting the bar.